section of the Government Information Service and the National Television Network. It's a program designed to bring to the fore the policies and plans of the Government of St. Lucia. You, our viewers, will have the opportunity to participate in our program, 90-minute live discussion via social media. You can send us your messages and definitely we will be happy to have you with us. I'm Ryan O'Brien and with me again once more is my co-host Lisa Joseph. Lisa, another program today in focus. And it's promising to be a very interesting one, one packed with information. We're discussing one of the key sectors for the Sinusha economy, that is tourism. And uh, But before we do that, we'll get into what is what will become customary, a look at some of the top stories uh, in the government for the week. Yes, and definitely the Minister for Social Justice, Local Government and Empowerment, the Honourable Leonard Mortout, says moves are afoot for the reintroduction of local government elections. Minister Mortout believes that town and village councils can best assist central government in determining and meeting the needs of constituents. The minister made a comment as he addressed a retreat for parliamentarians and local government officials. More from Chevroy Marius. This exercise is meant to empower you and to put you in a better position to carry out your mandate as local government. As part of continuing efforts to strengthen the local government system in St. Lucia, the Ministry of Equity, Social Justice, Local Government and Empowerment hosted a three-day retreat for local government members of parliament, mayors and chairpersons. The retreat was held at the Bay Gardens Hotel and will run from August 6 to August 8, 2019. One major undertaking of the consultation is legislative review of St. Lucia's local authority system and to ensure that legislation is responsive to current issues. Minister for Equity, Social Justice, Local Government and Empowerment, Honorable Leonard Mondoot, stated that his goal is to empower local government by creating a more effective and efficient local authority system. Well, certainly we want to empower the local government councils to a much greater extent. That will entail providing more resources. That will entail some legislative changes, as you indicated. And some of the changes would include, for example, when it comes to property tax collection and the administration of property taxes, that they would preside over the collection of property taxes. And while most of the revenue would be remitted to central government, to in inland revenue department, a percentage of it would be retained by the local government entity. If the local government entity is responsible for collection, I think there will be greater compliance, more revenue will be collected, more will revenue will be generated for the Inland Revenue Department. And while I'm not advocating for dismantling accountability, I'm saying that we can you know, dismantle some of the bureaucratic processes that will make for greater efficiency. Minister Montout also emphasized the need for local government elections to be introduced in St. Lucia. Since 1979, we terminated local government elections. Very often, people complain about the dearth of leadership in this country. Well, if you have no nurturing, no breeding ground for leaders, do not expect that leaders will come from the blue. I believe through local government, we can harness the talents and nurture the potential of would-be leaders who can through local government emerge and get involved in national elections after going through local government elections. Minister Montout stated that input from parliamentary representatives advanced the discussion on ways for councils to utilize available resources and opportunities. I'm hoping that uh, given the involvement of parliamentary representatives that when I go to parliament and make a presentation that we need those changes that I would have the full support given the fact that they would have had an input and would have participated in the process and they would have a full understanding and appreciation of what it is we're trying to do. Spokesperson for My Will Civility Global, Ambassador Clive Rivers, stated the importance for having productive dialogue. It's important that we have civil, true dialogue. That's what it takes. If, if, if people feel marginalized, that they have no voice, that becomes a problem. So we have to find ways to bring everyone to the table, everyone to the table. People have to understand that, that change doesn't take place quickly. You have to turn the wheels of change 
So to even engage people to a new way of thinking, that's the critical concept. In 2012, the government of St. Lucia established the Constituency Councils Act, which set in motion a review of the procedures and functions of local government authorities. Reporting from the Ministry of Equity, Social Justice, Local Government and Empowerment, I am Chevrolet Marius. And Prime Minister Honorable Alan Chastney during the 2019-2020 budget address identified the education sector as one of the key areas in the development process for St. Lucia. Honorable Chastney indicated then that government would be embarking on a series of programs aimed at revolutionizing the education system. And the Ministry of Education, Innovation, Gender Relations and Sustainable Development has taken a fundamental step in that direction with the awarding of scholarships under the EQUIP project for teacher training. 18 teachers will be taking up studies at the bachelor's and master's levels in a wide range of subject areas. Anissa Antoine has that report. The government of St. Lucia has partnered with the Caribbean Development Bank to fund a four-year scholarship program for teachers under the Education Quality Improvement Project, EQUIP. The program is geared towards enhancing capacity to improve teacher quality, relevance of education, and instructional effectiveness across the education sector. Scholarship awardees will be trained in a variety of areas, including education for gifted learners, curriculum and instructions, school counseling and social work, art education, and music education. The Minister with Responsibility for Education, Innovation, Gender Relations and Sustainable Development, Honorable Dr. Gail Rigabat, stated that this initiative is the government's response to the existing and emerging needs in the education sector. You will have observed, based on the areas highlighted, that we are catering for the multiple intelligences of our students. We are moving away from a very universal and one-size-fits-all curriculum to catering for our students who have various talents, who are gifted, who may have learning difficulties, and to ensure that indeed no child is left behind. Pertra Jason, who will be attending the Micro University College in Jamaica, is amongst the 18 individuals who received scholarships. Jan Promise and myself, we are going to complete our Master's in Social Work and Counseling. And um, we hope to come back and to implement what we've learned. It is an area which is much needed within the um, education sector. And we will be able to work alongside the Ministry of Education in terms of um, achieving the goals, overall goals of the ministry. So I am excited, like I said, I'm happy and proud. And again, I say thanks on behalf of everyone for, you know, extending this opportunity to all of us. The first cohort of scholars will leave the island on August 22nd, 2019. From the Government Information Service, I am Anisia Antoine reporting of infrastructure, ports and energy embarked on the second phase of the traffic flow management program on Monday. The, this involves the construction of a second northbound lane from Sandals Halcyon to the Shock Roundabout. The area between Sandals Halcyon and the Shock Roundabout has been identified as a major bottleneck leading to heavy traffic congestion during peak commute hours daily. It is against that backdrop that the Traffic Flow Improvement Program was conceptualized. Upon completion, the travel experience for more than 27,000 daily commuters would be improved. Engineers and technical experts from the Department of Infrastructure, Ports and Energy, along with representatives of the contracting firm, C.O. Williams Construction Limited, on Monday gathered at the site ahead of excavation works scheduled to begin Tuesday, 13 August 2019. Showman Sylvester is the senior engineer in the Department of Infrastructure, Ports and Energy. The objective is to ensure that we have a fall-in dual carriageway going from the Friendship Inn roundabout all the way to the Shock roundabout. So what you notice happening at the Sanders intersection where you have two lanes merging into one will um, no longer be. 
So you'll have that two-lane access where you'll be able to just traverse instead of what we have, the bottleneck we have within Sanders, which actually is a sub-point where persons can actually have little incidents and accidents. So we are looking to avoid this and ensure that the road um, remains free and clear for all road users. During a consultation forum with business interests in the vicinity of the project site, along with the minibus and taxi sector and utility companies, government received the support of the stakeholders. A major demonstration of that backing came from Sanders International, which allocated a substantial amount of its private property for the project. With several businesses in the vicinity of the project site and the volume of traffic constantly along the route, officials say heavy works will be undertaken mainly at night to minimize impact. Steve Brinkhurst is the contracts manager at C.O. Williams Construction Limited. The first phase of the works is actually building structures on this side, retaining walls, extending drainage, without little, well, little or no interference with the current traffic movement. The second phase is when is the interesting phase for us because we have to mill or, or grind away the existing asphalt and put new asphalt down. And we're planning to do those works after hours, you know, in the night time to minimise the traffic um, disruption. The problem here is that we cannot really divert this, this volume of traffic around this area. There's no routes. So that, that's what we've agreed with the Ministry, we actually uh, will do the work, the, the high impact work during the night. The construction of a second northbound lane from Sanders Halsey into the Shock Roundabout forms part of the government's wider plan for an improved road network in the north of the island. Senior engineer in the Department of Infrastructure, Sherman Sylvester, says a phased approach is being taken. The first part of the project the initiative actually started with the Willow Island Gases, where we looked at soft measures on um, reducing the right turn into there. This is the second portion, and then we are going to go on to the other sections, for example, the Shock Hill, the Marisil um, intersection, the Rodney Bay intersection. This is government's intervention in physics. The Sanders to Shock Roundabout Road Widening Project is scheduled to be completed in two months at a cost of $2.5 million. From the Government Information Service, Lisa Joseph reporting. Well, Lisa, thanks for that report. And Absolutely. we've had three very interesting reports on our segment there, our new segment. The whole idea of local government, that is something that I'm sure will be greatly appreciated by the members of the public as it eases a lot of regular transactions that the public would have to do rather than have to go into the more institutionalized and it could be you know done much more locally within the various constituencies on island we're definitely reducing public frustration with the system but most importantly i think in terms of governance and being able to determine what the needs of the various communities are because we have all of these small communities within larger communities but the local government officials they're on the ground central government is always concerned with what the bigger picture is and I think that for local government officials to assist more in being able to manage these communities, whether it be from the solid waste standpoint, um, being able to perhaps um, collect some taxes, we did hear from the minister saying that they can play a bigger role in that aspect, uh, being able to know where some of those problem areas are for infrastructure, little community infrastructural needs, um, so you can have the local government officials Having the election process is a good thing because then I, I think the public will definitely see themselves as being a stakeholder in what that process is and they can have a, an absolute and definitive voice in whom they elect and who they believe that would be working to their best interest. And it also allows now for these individuals to have more accountability uh, to the public and, of course, to central government. So mm -hmm. I think timeliness is a very important factor as well. We need to move on to, to the next um, segment, teacher training. And that's something I'm, I'm sure that the, the teachers would welcome and the whole fact that scholarships might be available. So that will be given them for the incentive. And I'm, I'm excited about this, Ryan, because uh, we often hear uh, the complaint that the education system is not meeting the everyday or the, what the modern era requires and so to have teachers um, go off to study at as many as 18 of them on scholarship in Jamaica and in Trinidad uh, it speaks to the government's commitment now to 
developing an education sector that is going to look at some of the non-traditional areas. So if you have more teachers going off and being trained in the arts, the theater, uh, music, then we can now begin to teach more of our students how to make use of their talents. And I, hear, I heard the education minister speak about not just culture, but how now can you generate revenue from culture? So everything is now business. So it's not just about saying that you can play the violin, but how can you now sustain yourself, get a livelihood out of that? And so I'm excited to see how this program under EQUIP is going to um, multiply itself. And I think we can definitely have some great turnaround in that. So we have the northbound commute is certainly plans to really improve on that. But you travel on that road, so do I, and the thousands of others. We have visitors as well. Uh, the bottleneck, I think um, now just having to depend on the courtesy of drivers, I don't think that's working much anymore. <laughs> and so we need to have that road expansion in order to accommodate. I think we have something like 27,000 um, daily commuters. Uh, this, it's, it's a large volume. And in order for us to be able to con transact business and, and have people for productivity, in the workplace, if you need to get to work on time, move around in a timely fashion. Definitely this expansion of the road is going to lead to that. Yes, and that particular junction has really had its fair share of crashes, uh, although some of them are not that extensive, but certainly will be able to ease the traffic congestion. Ease the traffic congestion. But also to mention that this is just one of the areas, problematic areas, because we know the Shock Hill, that's another problematic area and we did hear the senior engineer indicate that area is going to be looked at after the, the shock uh, roundabout area is dealt with. So good news. Yes Lisa, certainly so that's our first segment on In Focus today. We'll take our first break but we'll be back. La mer, c'est un bon place pour un bon temps, mais c'est faux qu'on ait un tsunami. Sous bon la mer, qu'on sent un tiers qui a tremblé en pile. BC, couvert pau, et espéré semblant à deux bouts, et couille mouté pour vous. Sous bon la mer, qu'on a witchy leg, qu'on a quitté l'ancien vitement. Couille mouté pour vous. Sous tant la mer, qu'on a fait un tout le désordre. Couille mouté pour vous. So when Nepotis sings a lot, who will you take three whole coca when morning? The be troisième étage of Kai, and espere les autorités annoncer sa descente. Who will, who will, who will you take three whole? Apprend les signes tsunami. La pépane a sept ans pour annoncer un tsunami qui a approché. C'est un commission par groupe management des arts et efforts, et classe management des arts en Saint-Lucie, et financé par l'Agence pour développement international Amérique, Bureau Assistance des Arts l'autre pays. Thank you so much for staying in focus. And now we're going to the tourism sector, full throttle. Uh, for St. Lucia, the tourism sector has proven to be exceedingly important, what we refer to as the lifeblood of the economy. Uh, just to give you some statistics as we uh, set the scene for you, for the first five-month period, that's January to May of this year, the island recorded 185,568 stayover arrivals. And that represented 6.1% more than the same period the preceding year. And that made it the largest number of stable arrivals ever recorded for St. Lucia in the history of St. Lucia. Fast forward to June, one month later, we have peaked at 34,040. That's up 9% from June of last year. So this means year to date growth has increased. So we had 6.5%, that's up from 6.1% the last month, as I told you earlier. And that figure also marked the fifth record-breaking month for the year for St. Lucia. 
So that sets the scene of how important tourism is to the economy of St. Lucia, to the thousands of St. Lucians who gain direct benefit from the tourism industry. To flesh out all of the issues of tourism, we have with us the Minister for Tourism, Information, Broadcasting, Culture and Creative Industries, Honorable Dominic Fede. Thank you so much. I know it has been a very painstaking time, but you've made time for us, so thank you so much thank for you. that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, it's good to be here. As I indicated, tourism for us, we continue to see that boom. That bubble is growing, and some people may be a little uh, apprehensive that at some point this bubble is going to burst. We'll talk about some of the contingencies a little later on, but the pressures of the tourism business, because the business of tourism is changing, and now we're seeing with Virgin Atlantic, we're beginning to see how things can shift, move in parts. When and how did the government find out about Virgin? Was it blindsided, this request by Virgin Atlantic for the sort of what we call the subsidy? Well, they have been having issues for a long time. I mean, if you look at the um, aviation industry, you would see that Virgin has been planning new routes and their network planning has been very active. So they've pulled out of Dubai, they've pulled out of Los, um, Los Angeles. And then the ownership of Virgin has changed as well. So Richard Branson, the founder of the airline, would have played a significant role in the decision making. He's only a 25% shareholder. And now so you now really have a board that manages Virgin correct. Atlantic. Um, but it's, now it's being controlled by KLM, Delta, and Air France, uh, those three. And the preposition, the business value, the philosophy is a lot different. And you would expect that there'd be some differences in terms of how the airline is structured and governed. Um, 21 years ago, it's a very long time. A lot has changed in St. Lucia's tourism. I mean, you've been talking about the figures. Uh, years ago, when Virgin came, we depended on the UK market more um, than we do now. Uh, in fact, the Caribbean market has surpassed the UK market in terms of arrivals. That's very critical uh, to us. Uh, Canada uh, didn't play a, a significant role as it does now. And certainly the United States wasn't the forerunner. And the United States market is just growing exponentially. We have not begun to tap into the opportunities that exist. And so the business has, has shifted. It, it would have become very difficult for us to pay the money to Virgin that they requested whilst we were getting flights from the U.S. without any subsidy requirements. So um, in the last eight months or so, we've had uh, seven flights a week from Miami, and then we have just announced another flight from Chicago. And these flights came about because of market forces. The destination is performing, the airlines have done their research, and they believe that this route is going to be profitable. There are a lot of great things happening in the U.S. Um, in comparison to the U.K., the economic forecast for the U.S. is a lot more bright. You look at what's going to happen with Brexit Looks in the UK. We can't, that's that's a, a fact I think most people are leaving out of that equation. Absolutely. So it'll be very difficult in the short term to get business from the UK for the Caribbean. Um, it becomes a, a question of sustainability. If you invest the money, can you get a return of 20 years from the money that you put into this airline? And that's that really is what it boils down to. What is going to be the return? Um, it's 7% of the business, Virgin. And, you know, it requires 20% additional to what we already spend on the UK market. So this would have meant we would have given Virgin an addition amounting to 20% of our total global market. It just doesn't make any business sense. But some people are concerned that even though it only represents 7%, of our global arrivals, that's still significant coming from that side of the world uh, to balance things out. So what have we done to shore up and to make sure that we're not seeing a significant fallout from that? Well, certainly, I mean, when you look at the unused capacity of St. Lucia, we've come close to bridging that gap. Um, I was worried for a long time about us being able to sustain the British Airways flight, which comes in and we've only managed to sustain it because of a tag with Trinidad. So it comes to St. Lucia and then it goes on to Trinidad. So we're basically sharing a flight with Trinidad. And so what I believe now is that all of this unused capacity, all of these um, concerns that may have existed before about sustaining the British Airways flight, I think that they have now disappeared because now perhaps um, the supply and demand for our island in terms of air seats uh, are probably now at a level 
uh, that is balanced and that is sustained. Now, uh, when we look at unused capacity, we have uh, 18,000 unused capacity. That is removing version from the equation, but other carriers. Um, and in addition to that as well, we've just had um, confirmation that British Airways will be adding an additional 7,000 seats this winter. And that is part of a longer term goal to add even more seats. So we have a, a meeting in September, which is critical. And I'm sure I'll be happy to report to you and the nation in terms of how those talks went. But um, we have seen uh, a number of other airlines, albeit charter airlines, that have come on board and have given us offers. Uh, but we want to see how the discussions go first. And so you're still discussing with Virgin? We are. Uh, we are open to um, all of our stakeholders. We're not alienating anyone. I think that uh, this is not a fight. Virgin made a business decision, and St. Lucia has got to make a business decision. And that's all it is, really. One other question on this. Um, with the, in the UK market, we've seen a 15% decrease and a 21% decrease from the rest of the world. Is this a Virgin Atlantic result? No, because the flights are, um, com are going to be discontinued in June next year. So we've got all of our seats. There's been no uh, reduction in air seats from St. Lucia. This is just a question of the market. Um, the year-to-date figure from the UK, though, is in the positive. So I think that the uh, figure you've seen is where June last year would have performed uh, less than June 2019. So that, that is what, sorry, I mean, June 2019 would have mm -hmm. um, declined significantly from what we did in June last year. But year-to-date, the UK is certainly in the black. Let me say, Minister, airlift certainly must be a, a concern for every tourism minister all around the world, maybe not just in St. Lucia. And is it something that preoccupies your ministry in terms of a continuous assessment as to other carriers that can come in? Or would a situation like what has been presented now with Virgin Atlantic cause that to be much more in the forefront? Or is this something that your, your ministry continuously looks at to look at other options so that in the event like we have now, that you'll have been in a much more favorable position to deal with that sort of impact? Yeah, but well, we've seen exponential growth in terms of the air seats from the United States market. So the global air situation, we're definitely um, in the positive. So that is really, really good. Uh, yes to your question, it preoccupies us all the time. The more seats you have, the more competitive you uh, can be as a destination. In fact, one of the issues that confronts us now is the whole question of airfares from the United States market. And that is because of the fact that from all of our gateways, you have just one airline. So when you go to Miami, it's controlled by American Airlines. When you go to Delta, it's in Atlanta. JetBlue controls the JFK airport. And you go down the line, and you see that the airlines really have a monopoly situation from major US gateways. That's an untenable situation. And you've got to try your best to create competition on these routes so that the destination of St. Lucia remains competitive. You know, what's amazing, though, is how strong the demand for St. Lucia really is. Because despite the high airfares in, compar in comparison to other Caribbean islands, all of our um, flights coming to St. Lucia uh, for the month of July, I just saw a preliminary report which suggested that they came at a 90% load factor. And that was the average of US airlines. When we looked at the high side, it was 94% um, by one particular airline. So that's pretty, pretty high um, as far as load factors are concerned. And you know, despite uh, high airfares, we're seeing this kind of uh, traction and demand for St. Lucia tells you about the work we've done in terms of repositioning the brand, uh, in terms of being a lot more visible, uh, being out there more. Uh, we have transitioned a lot of our marketing resources from uh, tour operator relationships and put that directly into consumer marketing initiatives. Um, I, we feel justified to end the Jazz Festival, which hemorrhaged the tourist board's budget. And we have said for a long time that while the festival had grown so big, it was also affecting significantly the ability of the island to promote the destination. The Jazz Festival didn't 
and still does not have the kind of traction for the amount of money we were spending. 14 million EC dollars. It became a national party and it certainly wasn't a tourism marketing event. Uh, yes, you got some business, but not $14 million worth of business. So what we did is to come in and to restructure that significantly. Out of a budget of $34 million, you spent $9 million in administration, $14 million in jazz. Uh, it meant that you had very little to promote Europe, the UK, um, the United States, and Canada. It, it really wasn't enough money, so we had to make some adjustments. And I think that those adjustments have actually paid off. Room stock has certainly been tagged alongside with the airlift. How are we doing in terms of that ratio, in terms of your, your, your airlift persons coming in and your room stock to be able to accommodate them? How are we faring presently in terms of that ratio? A lot better than we did between the periods of 1997 to 2006. Um, in fact, when we came in to, when we assumed office, um, Prime Minister Shastny at the time was Minister of Tourism and took a lot of blows um, because he saw that there was a, um, a deficit in terms of the airlift situation. While the room stock had grown, a lot, there was a lot of construction taking place pre-World Cup in preparation for the World Cup. There were some good incentives that hoteliers got and the industry had expanded rapidly, but the air seats did not. And the decision uh, taken by the previous government to um, let American Airlines go uh, was also a, a decision that, um, that impaired that situation and made it worse. So we had to uh, come in to see how best we can because you're, you're absolutely right. If you have rooms, how are people going to get here? You need seats to correspond with the room. So if you look at the national occupancy averages from then to now, you would see that the occupancy averages are much higher. And that is because uh, we took a very simplistic but pragmatic view to the development of tourism. The other thing is to make sure as well that we get a better return for everyone in the country. So now what preoccupies me more than airlift is how do I give the people of St. Lucia a better deal from tourism? So you see that we're doing the village tourism uh, project, encouraging more and more for the non-traditional accommodation sector. In fact, there are more locals in accommodation. That uh, accommodation sector where locals are selling their apartments and villas and Airbnb is oh, growing yeah. faster than the traditional um, hotel occupancy rates. So while the destination there, Lisa mentioned year to date we are 6.1, the report we're getting from Airbnb suggests that in that sector we're 15% up. And that is um, certainly causing hoteliers a lot of um, concerns and sleepless nights. That's an issue we want to talk about extensively, yeah. but go ahead of the point. But it shows you that there are a lot of people uh, benefiting from tourism. It's so and indirectly. What, what we have to focus on is making sure that we sustain this boom, that we regulate, we set the standards, and we set a philosophy for moving forward, and we ensure that this spirals. The brand St. Lucian, we've taken it. Let her inspire. What? Let her inspire us. Inspire Let you. Let inspire you, yeah. You, because we want to make it very personal. Uh, but we're going more on the luxury end. Uh, and you indicated that people are willing to pay because we've done so much work in building the brand. What then is um, that sort of pocket of concern that perhaps that if we would, this bubble were to burst, that we would not be able to sustain? what's happening with the brand at a luxury end. How are we maintaining that even though we were to have some trepidation in the world, that the brand St. Lucia is not affected at all? Or minimally? Well, the, the, certainly, I think it came from the point of view of the consumer. Uh, we looked at what's been happening, the changes that are taking place in our consumer trends for travel. And the trends certainly show that People are not into coming to destinations that just offer the experience of laying in a beach chair on the beach. So the idea of mass that's tourism is, is, yeah. is no, not? No, that's gone. But people are now looking for experiences. People are looking for islands with typography. People are looking for things that are rare. Um, what informs a lot of the travel now is, is Instagram and um, the rest of social media. 
and you know millennials are certainly taking over and dominating that space they are the future uh, markets and so you've got to begin as a destination to restructure your branding position to reflect uh, something that is with the times so that the youth that are looking for these unique experiences are, are, are far different from their parents who wanted a controlled environment who wanted to relax and there's still some business there but I think the bulk of it now and the bulk of the growth is going to come from the experiences so what uh, we found is that this uh, brand positioning uh, did help us better than you know the all simply beautiful St. Lucia tagline I mean I love that I grew up with that and personally I, I prefer it but uh, this is a, a business decision where um, we're beginning to position the brand in a way where we're saying to the future of travel, come and be inspired. And so on the ground, a lot of things need to happen in order to maintain the brand. So what are we doing for some of these? Uh, we look at the tours, we're looking for the excursions. Um, so what what is happening in that respect? Well, we have um, a lot of work that's going on um, in Sufre you would have seen in the village tourism initiatives uh, we have five new beaches being opened one of them is being done by a community group you see what's happening in Labry for example uh, with some yachting tourism and um, a lot of it is organically we, we can't take praise as a government but I think that when people see the bigger picture they are then inspired to get involved and they then see opportunity and that is the point, is to make sure that you inspire not just the market forces, but also inspire communities to, to take the bull by the horns, as we say, in the old cliche, and to invest and to get involved in this exciting industry, which is growing and presenting such vast array of opportunities for so many people. So we're opening four new beaches this winter to better distribute the... Um, amount of tourists that go on the beaches so that we can help to mitigate the user conflicts between hotel guests and cruise ship passengers. You, you have a big issue in Rodney Bay and also in Sufra, and you've got to get that under control to make sure that our coral reefs are not overused and they're not victims of over-tourism. And overcrowding on the beaches as well. Absolutely. So for some people who may want some sort of seclusion Correct. while they're enjoying um, the amenities. And then not, let's not forget our locals. Yes. I mean, you've got to also ensure that those parts that they like to go, that you do your best to avoid them. Uh, you know, the infusion of tourists in large numbers um, that would cause additional user conflicts. But you, you've got to manage the thing well. Um, on the days when we like to go to the beaches on Saturdays and Sundays, that's when most of the flights are leaving and coming. So that's the kind of seven-day cycle. So that works well in that, you know, th the beaches are sought after by tourists mostly Monday to Friday. And the big arrival and departure days in the hotels are the days that we like to go. So I think that we've been very fortunate that that's been working. Uh, let's move to Booking.com. That is a sort of for people a little worrying because um, it is uh, something now how the world is now beginning to conduct business as far as tourism is concerned. There has been that request or demand if you want the 15% commission um, from service charge. You've indicated that it can't work and it can't be not just from a St. Lucia perspective but from a Caribbean perspective as chairman of the Caribbean Tourism Organization. Uh, in your discussions what has been the latest development with that issue? Well, the latest development is that um, we're putting together a private public sector um, team to have a very strong uh, meeting with Booking.com. The private sector has already written to them. Um, my letter is um, on its way to them as well uh, to say that this is unconscionable. Uh, the issue for your viewers is that the service charge that they receive from the booking, they would like to commission that as well. But this is going into employees. These are employees that uh, are of, of hotels, and uh, that should go straight to their bottom line and not to the hotel or to booking.com. And so I think that um, there is consensus on the part of the private and public sector that what booking.com is doing 
Um, it has severe ramifications for the future of this business, and if we allow them to get away with it, then I think it will um, certainly impact the bottom line of all of us. Globally, though, the Caribbean can really depend on some of the international partners as well, because Bookingbook.com, by virtue, see, if you want to call it a conglomerate, um, so are you getting or have you had any sort of dialogue with some of the international partners on this very issue uh, to tell unequivocally to Booking.com that you just can't meet that demand? Yeah. But unfortunately, I don't think it's illegal. And that is the problem in the absence of legislation. So legislatively, we've got to look at what we can do as a region as well to protect our employees from such um, inhumane positions. Uh, it's unconscionable and we've got to do everything and use lobbying, yes, but then we've also got to put the laws down. Okay. Okay, uh, maybe we could just take a shift again and look more at the growth of tourism and uh, some of the areas in generally stay over and cruise and certainly one aspect of St. Lucia life and culture would be the impact of the contribution of St. Lucia Carnival towards the overall project and product actually. Can you tell us you know, the sort of impact that you've been realizing recently now that most of our festivals have been restructured with the aim of ensuring that we get more visitor arrivals and persons who will come on, love the experience and also to spend some money in St. Lucia? Well, there's an amazing figure for July. It says that July of 2019 performed 25% better than July of 2018. And so, you know, during Carnival, I heard the layman in the street and everyone saying, this is the best of a Carnival. And, you know, I've never seen so many tourists here for Carnival. So many foreigners have come in and so on. And when I checked the numbers, I mean, it was an astounding 25% increase uh, July over last year. So that is pretty encouraging. I mean, I'm on a high. I feel very, very good. The hotels were rammed. Uh, it was very difficult to find a hotel room. And what was great is that when you see there's a strong demand, the prices will go up. So our hoteliers got really good rates as well for their accommodation during that period. But it goes back to what we were saying. If you spend 14 million on jazz, and then you give your own culture $1 million, which was what obtained in the past, then you're doing a disservice to your own people, to your music industry, and to your own heritage. And so when we came in, this is what we said. This whole idea that we're importing all these other cultures and creating a, um, a, a deficit in terms of exporting our culture, I think that that is wrong and it's bad policy. And what we have decided to do is to make Carnival be the biggest thing. And we've always said we would need three years to do it, and we've done it. But part of that as well, Ryan, is also to ensure that we promote our music. Because what really drove the numbers, it's got to be the guys in Denry segment and Tedison John and Ricky T and all of them that have been overseas and they have been promoting our music. They've been working uh, very hard. And our support for them is in keeping with building the brand of St. Lucia's music industry, St. Lucia's Carnival. However, I will tell you that we need to do a better job in terms of sustaining this. We need to do a better job. We have to be deliberate at making this happen. So it can't be because there's a music revolution in our country called um, the Denry segment that we will say yay and then we go flat. So we've got to make sure that we are planning, that we are building the product, we're building the capacity of our uh, artisans. Uh, we've never been short of talent. But what is apparent is that we've always been short of the business know-how of this industry. I, I see people of lesser talent in the Caribbean and they are more prominent and their music business is more lucrative than ours that are more talented and so we've got to now get that part right the marketing of our music um, the contracting of artists the management of artists and it's something that i intend to do i mean i've been given the opportunity now to uh, work with minister bellarose on 
the culture and creative industries. And we're having those discussions to make sure that the plans are speedy and the plans are robust to ensure that we build that capacity in our music industry. Because I think it's been overlooked for many years as a, an economic development tool. Uh, a lot of our youngsters would like to go into it, but unless you have a number of um, bright stories to tell, parents are going to discourage their children from ever partaking. Um, youngsters are not going to see this as a future. And I think that for the entire industry, we can do ourselves a tremendous good. Mr. Minister, I sense your enthusiasm yeah. and your, your great interest. What does this do now for government and the country as a whole, having these numbers come in for, for, for the carnival celebration? I'm sure it provides the opportunity now to expose St. Lucia to all these persons who are coming in, these extra arrivals, persons coming from near and far, to other aspects of St. Lucian life. I'm sure this is something that your ministry has looked at in terms of how can we tap on this platform that Carnival is actually setting. Is this something that you are really looking at closely? Let's say maybe in terms of exposing other parts of St. Lucian life, maybe the rural communities, even your, your own village uh, tourism that you're speaking of. How does that inspire you to go forward in those areas? Well, it inspires me. When I, when I, I mean, I, I sit back and I do a very unscientific rating of what has happened in the last two years and if you had to pick a carnival in the world on momentum it would be St. Lucia. Uh, we're not where Trinidad is but in terms of momentum in terms of pace of growth it's us um, and this is something that should inspire us this is something that we shouldn't waste but we should maximize the moment. But in times like these Rob in history you've got to make sure that it's a turning point in the development of your country that is transformational of people, of an industry, or anything. This is an opportunity that we shouldn't allow to go begging. And I intend to make sure that we do everything we can to create the coalition we need to create between our bands, between our musicians, government policy to create the right enabling environment, uh, tourism marketing strategy, and airlift support so that we can ensure that we build a strong nexus not just between our culture and tourism but between our cultural industries and building of an economy out of that conversation we can't leave the more traditional festivals of the la wars la marguerite a lot of people are wondering we've done so much with carnival what now can we do for these flower festivals to make them as appealing as carnival is lisa um when i did Jeanne Creole, in my constituency in a community called Jack Mel. You know it very well. Mm -hmm. I got $6,000. The committee got $6,000. And we had to raise all the rest in sponsorship because you had to get stage, sound, uh, lights. I mean, put up the booths. It's, it's a nightmare to do it with 6,000 EC dollars. 6,000 EC dollars could barely organize your birthday party. But we give that to our communities and say, there you go. I am happy to tell you that now the allocation, the last allocation I saw to Jeanne Creole was $600,000. And that is the level of investment and that is how serious we are about making sure that where there are cultural assets, that you invest in them, you build them, you give them capacity, and you make people feel proud for many years, right, we were, in, we were proud to say that we're bringing Luther Vanross to sing on a stage and we're sterilizing the stage for Luther Vanross and getting crazy about him as a country. Whilst all of these festivals you spoke of, they were, they were neglected. And that's bad policy. And this is the point, is to make sure that any of these festivals that are solution, that they are given the same level of treatment, the same level of prestige, as we do with those festivals that are foreign. And so the CDF, uh, now under your uh, ministry, their task really is to deal with the talent because I think sometimes people get a little confused as to what is the role of the CDF right now? Is it strictly to deal with talent? Be, are are they the ones putting put put on be, the events? Needs to be redefined in terms of you know in events in Lucia and CDF and um, what is going to be 
uh, each other's roles. And I think we've got to properly define those better. Uh, yes, there, there is some collision there. And as far as um, I, I see that CDF's role is to work on the development side. But I think in the absence of events in Lucia, CDF was the management company as well that did the events management for our festivities. But now that there's events in Lucia, I think it will take some time uh, for this to be properly clarified. So there's some overlapping and stepping on toes, but I'm sure that they'll get it right. Roots and soul, we're just a week or so away yeah. from that happening. Um, this year, the lineup, quite a concentration on making sure that it's a little more expanded than what it was last year. And a number of local artists, or say Nushan artists, let's put it this way, because some of them are resident and non-resident. So the thinking behind putting together this year's Roots and Soul, how different did you want to make it from last year's? Um, you know, I, I, I tend not to get too involved in the lineup. I leave that to other people to do, uh, to be quite honest. But I'll tell you that um, the feedback so far is very, very good. There's certainly a lot of, um, a lot of interest. You know, how, when you, as a politician, how you know if something is going to score is when your constituents are asking you for tickets. tickets. So I'm getting a lot of requests. So I know that that's um, very, very um, encouraging. And I, I know that it's going to be a, a blast. The, Feedback I'm getting from hotels suggests as well that bookings are, are up and uh, we're seeing a lot of people from Martinique coming through for it. So it's um, beginning to grow as a cultural um, tourism event. But again, uh, Carnival and, and Jeanne Creole, they have to be the focus. You're in focus with us. When we come back with our discussions with the Minister for Tourism, we'll be looking at closely the cruise sector and what are some of the numbers there, what are some of the programs the government is instituting, and how all of that can benefit you. Stay with us. You're in focus. This climate is changing and that affects all of us. Storms are becoming increasingly intense. Periods of intense drought and heavy rain stress farm animals and destroy our crops. Higher average ocean temperatures kill our coral reefs and change the migratory patterns of fish. St. Lucia contributes only 0.0015% of global greenhouse gas emissions, but is doing its part, along with countries around the world, to reduce the emissions that are warming our world and changing our climate. These efforts are called mitigation. But decades of emissions have already changed the climate, and the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere today will increase average global temperatures even more. We need to adapt, that is, do everything we can to prepare for and respond to the actual and expected negative effects of climate change, and everyone has a role to play. We need to protect our crops, build homes that withstand storms, and keep our drains and waterways free of garbage to help us recover or bounce back from climatic events. Learn more about the Government of St. Lucia's National Adaptation Plan and the steps you can take to protect yourself and your fellow St. Lucians. And welcome back. You're in focus with us is the Minister for Tourism, Honorable Dominic Fede. Before we went to break, we were talking about uh, the cruise sector. We have seen an exponential growth, particularly following the rehabilitation at Point Seraphim. Uh, so that both that was um, newly done there. That has added to the sort of appeal of the accommodation of those larger vessels coming into St. Lucia. Uh, for your ministry, now that we have some of the bigger vessels, bigger numbers coming in, what is the plan in being able to manage and sustain? Well, I think we referenced some of it when we spoke about the overcrowdedness in some of our beaches and opening new beach facilities um, and ensuring as well that we are clear 
in terms of what we're doing, um, opening your attractions as well to give the cruise passengers a lot more opportunities to go into different parts of the island. Uh, it presents an opportunity as well for communities, but it is to tell those communities that here are opportunities for you. Um, in the case of um, the, some of the beaches we're opening up, two of them are in Ansari. Uh, one are in, is, is in Canaries. And, you know, these are communities where the cruise vessels would drive past. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they would leave the, the port and go on their way to uh, Sufre. Here are opportunities as well for Marigo. What is their offering? And so on. So um, I'm very optimistic about this season in terms of how we will manage the flow of cruise ship passengers and how we will better distribute them across our communities and decentralize that whole approach. Rather than having um, focused enclaves, you will now have a situation whereby cruise passengers are going to be better distributed. You've termed this year as the year for revenue. Yes. Uh, for, for tourism. So, and you've also announced a cruise conversion program. Yes. Discuss for us how that, what is it, and how is that going to be beneficial to the ordinary man? Because the typical complaint is that person say, I don't see the benefit of tourism. I don't get it. So, how does the cruise conversion program allow for the ordinary person to understand and feel the impact of tourism? The cruise conversion program is mostly for hotels. It's a big revenue generating program. It certainly is going to generate a lot of jobs because if we get the kind of growth that we are uh, envisioning, then the hotels are going to have to hire more people. Then they're going to have to buy more supplies. Then they're going to need more of everything, all of the inputs that they would um, consume locally. So if you look at the cruise business, it's the biggest advertisement to your country. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Unfortunately, um, without a regional position or consensus, you can't apply more taxes to get more money from cruise uh, passengers. What, what you must do is to use market forces to increase the yields of the destination. So rather than complaining, what you've got to say, well, um, the cruise lines and the cruise business is structured the way it is, how can we milk more? So we said that We've spoken about this as an industry for 20 years, converting cruise passengers to longer stays. So we will have a most dynamic um, sales center at Point Seraphin, where all of our hotels, big and small, will present an opportunity for cruise passengers to come back on a future stay, but for a longer stay, because the money is really in land-based tourism. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, we've got two-thirds of the business coming from cruise, and then just about a third from land-based tourism. You want your tourists to stay for as a long time as possible. But the cruise passengers, they're here for eight hours. The, the boat is there at 7 o'clock, and by 4, it's gone. So you've got to now say, um, all right, you've been in the tour, you've sampled St. Lucia, but now really s sink your teeth into St. Lucia, because it takes more than a day to, to really, really enjoy yourself and to see and to appreciate what St. Lucia is about as a destination. So this is what the program is about. But we have the potential to generate uh, you know, tens of millions in sales. And that is where the money is. More government revenue as well. This is a shop that's going to be uh, appointed by the St. Lucia Tourism Authority. And looking at what's available to the cruise passenger, you have a, a specific program that's dealing with the sort of development of the vendors. Some training has already um, been done. What more is happening with ensuring that once the cruise passenger is perhaps going through the different uh, communities, you have the viewing points to get them excited about spending, and that's the important thing, the cruise spend. Well, I think a fundamental one is the training of the vendors um, because what it does it says to them, this, these are the set of products that are likely uh, to sell. Um, one of the things that we do is we keep selling the same products. And if I'm in business and you're not buying my products, then I can't complain. I've got to then say, well, what do I sell? If you're not interested in buying ice cream, then maybe you want to buy sorbet. Um, so, so this really is to get the vendors to be better business people, 
to understand merchandising sales, product placement, their procurement has, has got to be more um, authentic products. We're also training the suppliers of craft as well to improve that side. So there is a, a project um, on the way to train our craft vendors in, in Chozelle um, so that the artisans, the products that they're uh, delivering to the market, not just to the vendors, but also to the hotels, are going to be superior in quality, but with one word at the center, and that is authenticity. Um, and I think that once you do that, you're likely to have increased sales because nowhere else in the world can I find this bag designed this way than St. Lucia. And that is what people buy, uniqueness. Not the same thing that I can find in Puerto Rico or St. Martin. And you have to remember as well that we are far south. And so it's to give that appreciation to all the people in the business that you've got to be different from the other ports. You've got to be different from the other destinations because the cruise passenger would have been bombarded with a lot of the things that you've got. How many t-shirts can they buy? How many bead chains and bracelets can they buy? So it is to make sure that we give direction to all of our stakeholders. But fundamentally, you've got to also improve the area around the port. So the market should not just be a place of craft. It should be a place of culinary excellence. Yes, it's a fresh produce area, but no one is doing food in a way that you will take me to lunch. And if you are not excited about going to the market for lunch, why would the cruise passengers be? And so that's this a is fundamental thing, because fundamental. you always hear, the visitors always ask you, where can I eat like the locals? That's what they say. I want, Absolutely. To, I want to do like the locals. Absolutely. But it's got to be done uh, with style and it's got to be done with class. But it can be done locally. Uh, and so you've got to now engender. There's just a global culinary standard that you've got to meet. And we're training that side of it as well. The reconstitution of the market mm -hmm. has already begun, so that's going to improve the facelift. The numbers are suggesting that while St. Lucia has a very high disembarkation rate from the vessel, um, some of our main uh, lines are telling us that the, the percentage of the time the boat is at port uh, the, the, the guests would come off, but they would stay for a short period and get back on the boat. Because so it, it means doesn't feel like there's anything that's holding their attention. Absolutely. So it's, it's now for us to uh, improve upon the facade of, of castries, to uplift castries, to make it feel comfortable. It's an eyesore at the moment, uh, our city center and the general area of the cruise port. And we've, we're, we're now working with the World Bank on the OECS Tourism Competitive Project. Um, in the next three years, we are going to be spending $40 million to implement some of the projects that will uplift it. So the William Peter Boulevard will be a pedestrianized area. I know that the MP for Central Castry, Sarah Flood Bobra, has been working with my ministry to make sure that we can implement that project. Uh, but what it does, if you pedestrianize the boulevard, then restaurants can come into the streets and uh, people can sit outdoors and um, watch locals as they walk by. And, and they, they now intermingle and they, they are now interwoven into what we're trying to do. And that is the whole thing, is to create um, the, the kind of ambience where people are in a tropical city center. And these are, ki these are some of the conveniences, these are some of the experiences that you would want coming into uh, a, a tropical city center. So that's one of the projects that I know that, that's well on the way uh, to being done. And that's going to improve the length of time that people stay. I, I must congratulate the mayor. Um, we've seen a significant reduction in the uh, amount of burglaries against cruise mm -hmm. passengers. We've, the numbers suggest Post that it's... Snatching and... Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's because of the implementation of the city police. So that has been a big improvement. What I'm going to say, though, is that we've got to do a better job at implementing things a lot quicker. Uh, this project that we're doing began since I was in the private sector. So the report was done in 2013, and we're now in 2018, and we're just implementing some of the steps. But, but the world would have changed a whole lot from then. And if you're not implementing things in a timely fashion, you're going to be left, left behind. behind. And so I'm concerned about that. The implementation rate is extremely slow, and we've got to do something to work a lot quicker 
to implement things. Uh, this really is a question of uh, the capacity, the passion and enthusiasm of our civil service. And we've got to be more productive. Do you see a place for uh, the, 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 the sort of showcasing of St. Lucia's uh, talents? Um, once we get that William Peter Boulevard pedestrianized and you create a sort of area um, within the city that the tourists could perhaps watch some plays, uh, um, has live concerts. Of the, do, you, do we see a place there for that sort of activity to hold the interest? I, 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 think we need to, I think we need to find a new job for you. I think you need to come <laughs> in the industry because that is exactly the kind of thing that people want to see when they come to a destination, and that is um, to, what's the place for culture? You're absolutely right. Um, as part of the village tourism project, one of the things that I am designing for Ancillary is, um, is a, a historic story, but it will be told uh, with carnival costumes. So I can tell you the history of St. Lucia with one of our festivals and to have that properly choreographed. But here you have a big fusion between the culture and the history and it makes a very enchanting experience for an excursion. And it, it really then uh, differentiates from anything that exists. And this is how you differentiate yourself as a destination by making sure that those aspects of your culture that are strong, that you differentiate your, the experiences that people can have in your destination with them. So you're absolutely right. Mr. Minister, we want to give you the opportunity to go through as many aspects of po as possible of the industry. Oh, I need to we, make, keep my answer yeah, short. Yeah. Yes, before yeah. we take in the calls within the next 10 minutes. So we would like to look at um, development of new sector concepts, uh, particularly we spoke a lot about it before, but we want to go more in depth because you know that the village tourism is something that's very important. We also want to look at the Airbnb that you did mention earlier as well in more detail and some, some of the concerns of the hotel sector that you mentioned. And... Uh, Maybe just a, a brief look at information and broadcasting. So first of all, the, the village tourism, we know that it's something that's really going to have a lot of spin-offs because it will also encourage the whole aspect of focusing on the needs of the constituencies as well. So but before we go into those, we'll take another break. When we come back, we look at those areas. Thank you so very much, Ryan. in receipt of an abnormally high bill, it is highly possible that you have a leak. That leak may not always be visible. Before you contact Wasco, conduct a do-it-yourself test. 1. Record your meter reading. 2. Do not use water for 30 minutes to 1 hour. 3. Take another meter reading. If the reading changes, you have a leak. Contact a plumber to identify and fix the leak at the earliest. A message brought to you by the Water and Sewage Company Incorporated, Wasco. Thanks for keeping the focus. So, Minister Fede, we looked at just before the break the aspect of village tourism and the Airbnb situation. Could you comment uh, much more on this and really expand apart from what you've, you've told us previously? Yeah, well, I think the big opportunity is here for uh, St. Lucia nationals to be involved in the tourism sector. You know, there are issues of um, the capacity to find the high intensity, uh, intensive activity of, of capital that's required. And so when um, you, know, you have the technical support uh, with a management organization that is Village Tourism Incorporated, then it gives that kind of support and empowers St. Lucians more than ever before to get involved. A lot of local businesses, for example, don't know that they can get concessions just like the big hotels. And it's been um, a, a, a bit of a concern for quite some time, a chronic situation whereby they haven't had the ability to hire, you know, professionals that are sophisticated like lawyers and so on to advise them. 
But now, um, village tourism will be able to give that guidance, that support to say, before you build, apply for concessions, organize your taxes, um, so that they can more effectively participate in tourism. So this is what it's about. The legislation is completed. It's before cabinet. I know it's going there on Monday to be tabled. And we are doing the consultation right now. And by November, we should have the legislation pass, which will then make the entity village tourism a legal entity. And now we'll be able to go ahead, recruit the employees, and begin the process of, of setting up shop. And so we have in each village, or the chosen villages, or the areas rather, Grosely, Ancillary, and Sufre. Um, but there are five additional villages. The five of ones as well. Yeah. Uh, they will be individually themed. Yes. So can you speak to that? Do yeah. we know? So certainly I think that um, you can see that Grosely is carving out itself. Um, they are the, the party village. Um, Ancillary has carved out its niche to be the village that's going to focus on festivals. Um, and then as well, you look at um, Sufria, health and wellness um, is their thing um, with the sulfur springs and the volcano and all of um, what's going on. So naturally, there is that experience. Um, it is still a working progress in terms of uh, defining um, what shape the other villages will take in terms of their own development. But this is the first phase we have looked at. Um, the assets and we've realized that in these three villages you have um, significant tourism products that you can already build on so hence the reason for choosing them okay we just want to remind so, callers so whilst uh, the village tourism um, entity is being set up we are putting in infrastructure as you see in the case of Sufri and uh, Grosley and Ansari to a lesser extent Okay, we just want to remind viewers that you can call in with your questions. The telephone number is 4682162. And we're also taking your questions on Facebook. So feel free to send that in. Uh, Airbnb, which would sort of be, well, it's already in, in existence. And I suppose under the village tourism, you'll have a more refining of what that offering will be because licensing will have to come into play. The question, I know that the hotel sector has been asking whether the Airbnbs will be taxed and all of because to pay their fair share. Uh, how are you balancing not really sort of stifling the Airbnb sector, which subsector, which is really giving a livelihood to so many in the inform in an informal way, uh, but at the same time ensuring that regulation is put in place because regulating it is important. Very important. Uh, it sustains it. Um, it allows us to manage it properly, and that is critical to the future of the livelihoods that are in place. But um, I think that if the uh, Airbnb sector was tax. My argument to the hoteliers is that we will give them concessions as well, just like you're allowed. Um, at present, the law allows for uh, people that are um, operating six rooms or more, but we're going to have to look at that and address that to um, include all tourism providers because the landscape has changed significantly since 1998 when the legislation was written. So um, those legislative changes are being considered. And it's one of the things we've got to do in the short order to ensure that our Airbnb sector, the indigenous economy, I call it, mm -hmm. is, um, is, is able to participate. But I must tell you, Lisa, that a lot of hotels are selling on Airbnb as well. Mm. So they found a way to coexist. Yes, yes. All right. Don't forget you can call us in here in Focus. The telephone number is 4682162. Your questions for the Tourism Minister. We want to veer into another aspect of uh, your ministry, and that's with information broadcasting. There has been some public discussion on what's happening two years on since uh, Radio St. Lucia uh, faced closure. Uh, there has been some indication by yourself in uh, that the move is towards having a national broadcasting network. Yes. What, wh what stage are we at with that, and what would be required to make it happen? A lot has changed since Radio St. Lucia was established. It started as WIBS sometime in the 1970s. It was the Windward Islands Broadcasting, and then when the WIBS folded up, um, it grew into Radio St. Lucia. 
And in those days, the AM frequency dominated. But radio has changed a lot since then. The media has changed a lot since then. The consumption patterns of solutions have changed a lot since then. And so this whole question as to the relevance of a national broadcasting um, radio station, whether it is relevant, it, 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 it really um, raises a very serious question. And it, it, you have to give it a lot of analysis. Um, radio St. Lucia, it was millions of dollars in debt. It couldn't pay the employees NIC contributions. It couldn't pay um, its bills. It owes a lot of uh, its suppliers. And when we come in, um, we had to rescue a situation. We had to pay the bills of the um, employees. Uh, they are PAYE, for example, a number of years were outstanding to the IRD. Um, their NIC contribution, for example, a number of years were outstanding. And it was just a messy situation that we had to get rid of. Um, the management of it and then you had the situation whereby I think taxpayers were being taken for a ride with Radio St. Lucia. Um, it became a nest for uh, political parties to put their cronies. So whenever the government changed, the personalities changed at Radio St. Lucia as well. And, you know, it became so bad prior to the last general elections where it was a campaigning tool where the previous administration used it to, to carry a political message. It had drifted so far from what it was originally intended to be, uh, a national broadcasting hub that would focus on issues of national development to being a, a political messenger for the government of the day. And, and that was un untenable, and we had to address that as well. So hence the decision. We allowed it to go into um, receivership. It still is. And I know that the receiver is trying to um, sell off the assets to see how best she can pay off a lot of the bills. But we did right by the employees. We actually met a lot of uh, obligations to them, more so than we had to do by law, uh, because we did appreciate that a number of them were working there for many, many years. Now, let me answer your question um, following that very long preamble. There is a piece of legislation which I um, introduced um, very vaguely to the Parliament uh, and it's a broadcasting authority legislation and this was rather controversial it requires a lot more consultation with the local media you know very often when you try to add structure you are being accused of trying to muzzle the media if you ask me I believe that uh, they ought to be a lot we need to manage the uh, our media products a lot better. I mean, Facebook is out of control. If I want to harm your reputation, all I need to do is open 20 fake book names and tomorrow your friends will begin to think of you, uh, you know, differently, differently as they do now. So how are you going to regulate that? Is that fair to you? I am the biggest proponent of freedom of speech. Look at me, I'm very, very vocal. I love an, to debate and I love the whole idea. But I think as well that if I make a point, that point must be substantiated with facts. And I appreciate that with my rights in freedom of expression, they come with certain responsibilities. And those responsibilities ought not to collide with another person's rights. I cannot just go ahead and say anything I want about you because I have the freedom to speak. So yes, there are some existing laws that cover libel, and, and so on. But I think we need to go deeper in terms of making sure that we structure our media and we manage the media sector a lot better than we do. Um, while we have this debate, a number of our, the countries, the biggest proponents of freedom of speech, they have broadcasting authorities that do exactly that. The United States does. Uh, the UK uh, that created democracy. Well, no, sorry. The, the idea came from um, Greece, the Greeks did, but the United Kingdom sold the idea and made it global. And, and they have a uh, broadcasting authority that looks at how do you regulate media. And so we cannot, as a media, and I speak not as a politician here, but as a, a, 
a former media practitioner and someone whose professional philosophy is embedded in media. That's where I got my start. It's my first job. And so I have a deep personal interest in media to see it thrive, to see the media go forward. But it's to make sure that we do this well. It is too important, the media. The role that, that you play is too critical to the development of our country, to give people information that is fair and balanced and informed, that is properly researched. So the job of a journalist is of vital significance to the development of this country. And so you, you cannot just go ahead and do things in a rush. And, you know, I, I'm, I, I, the time has come now where we've got to sit down with the Media Workers Association. Is there a Media Workers Association? There, there is one. There is? Um, they're, they are certainly very quiet, and I don't know what the activities are. But we, we need to sit down. And, and discuss how do we go forward and you know these discussions have been happening even before I entered journalism mm -hmm. it's been years and years and I've seen presidents come and go and we're still where we are we have a question from Facebook and uh, Jody wants to know we you spoke about the national broadcasting policy but also the Freedom of Information Act and how can an independent reporter journalist one who's not attached to a media house gain equal opportunity for access as a media house worker um, and perhaps uh, through a government-issued press pass system? Well, I, I think that we've been pretty liberal as a government. We've been the more accessible. We've come in, and even in the worst of times, even when we have been derided over matters or subjects of the day, we have kept our weekly cabinet briefings where ministers are there, and we are open. Uh, sometimes I believe that perhaps we're too open and we're most transparent because we believe that, you know, a democracy is strong when you are giving people information, um, where you're giving them access. And I think that if you check with the Prime Minister's um, senior communications person, Nicole MacDonald, I'm sure that she would, um, once she meets the credentials, I'm sure that she would to be, be able to gain yeah. access so anyone want in discussion Correct. can get uh, access to information but the idea of a freedom uh, information act that has been some discussion for a while where persons feel and not just asking a minister but being able to access certain records and documents um again let's sit down this is a very important discussion, the Media Workers Association and all the relevant stakeholders have got to come together. What does the Media Workers Association think about this? What's their position? What's, what, what, you are in that business. Um, what is your association when you speak to your colleagues? Um, what do they think? And, you know, there are certainly efforts at drafting bills, but um, the, the media is largely suspicious of politicians whenever we try to come up with bills to improve the sector. And it, it becomes a, a, difficult, uh, a, a difficult subject area to, to, to confront. But you know, my focus has been, honestly, on making sure that the government information service, it, that you have the equipment, that you are modernized. You guys are doing a great job in terms of the introduction of new shows. You've got your nightly news. Um, this show certainly is a very new product that you're doing and you're doing your best from a public sector standpoint to bring government to the people bring information to the people and this is um, a windfall moment for the democracy of St. Lucia and congratulations well, Mr. Minister we would really like to thank you for being on our program today and for giving us further insight in a number of areas that you're responsible for and we're happy that members of the public have been able to get a bit closer to most of these issues that are relevant to them. And I'm sure that they'll be a lot clearer on the policies and the plans of government in relation particularly to tourism, as we spoke about, information and broadcasting and other areas that's developing within the concepts of tourism. This has been In Focus. We're certainly happy that you were able to join us here at the Government Information Service and the National Television Network. And on behalf of my co-host, Lisa Joseph, I'd like to thank the Minister Honorable Dominic Fede once more. We're hoping that you have a very pleasant day and join us next week when we go in focus.